Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, my, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon. A beautiful, beautiful spring day in Tulsa, and uh, it's a beautiful day to have all these people in from out of state. We've got Iowa people here, Minnesota, Indiana. Did we decide that? Ohio? Yeah, how could I forget Ohio? <laughs> and uh, good time of the year to show off uh, our beautiful city. I love Tulsa. I have ever since I went through it the first time when I was in service. And I thought, my, what a pretty city this is. So uh, we want to welcome all you, but all you local people as well. We appreciate the fact that you take the time and the effort to come in and be here with us. Now, for those of you out in television, again, we just have to thank you for your prayers, your support your financial help. We never ask for money because we never have to. It just keeps coming in and all we can do is praise the Lord and thank every one of you that are so generous and uh, are so supportive of what we're doing. My, how it thrills our hearts when uh, we read these letters. And we're getting letters from a lot of preachers that are getting their eyes open. Unbelievable. And uh, we appreciate that. Okay, now we're going to pe- keep right on going in our but God, but now, and we didn't finish the last but now. We only got as far as the rapture. And uh, so we're going to turn back to 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter. And uh, going to do like I did at the beginning, work our way down to the but now that we're looking at. And so I'm going to go back to, oh, about verse 14, just as a feed in to the but now that we want to be looking at. Verse 14, 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found as false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. In other words, Paul says we are lying if God indeed did not raise up Christ. But he did. Now verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sin. Now what does that tell you? What I've been stressing over the years. It's not enough to believe that Christ died for you. That's only half a gospel. You also have to believe with all your heart that Christ arose from the dead, victorious over sin and death and Satan and all the principalities and powers. Otherwise, we still have nothing. All right? So then he says, you are yet in your sin. Now, verse 18, then they also who are fallen asleep... Now, I better stop right here and define the term asleep in Scripture because we know there are groups that teach a soul sleep. Don't you ever believe it. I made the comment when I first started on television years ago, and I've repeated it, maybe not often enough, that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image, not in the likeness of a human body, but in his invisible image makeup. And remember, I've always pointed out that God himself, all three persons of the Godhead have the same attributes of personality. They all have a mind, they all have will, they all have emotion. But they're all invisible. You know, I make a point of it. You can go into an autopsy. And I used to do quite a few of them when I was in service. And you can cut that brain every which way possible and you will not find the will. You will not find the soul. You will not find the seed of emotions. Why? They're invisible. But does that mean they're not real? Well, we know they're real. You know you have a mind. You know you have a will. You know you have a set of emotions. You laugh. You get angry. But you can't touch it. All right, that's God. See, God is an invisible personality. All right, now we were created then in that invisible mode of mind, will, and emotion, and then God merely put that invisible makeup into this earthly tabernacle. All right, so now then, 
That being the case, if the soul was created in the image of God, can it ever fall away from activity? Never. So the soul never sleeps or dies. The soul is always a living entity. Now the body, it will die. And that's really the King James word sleep. The body will die, but resurrection day, it too will be brought back to life. And that's our glorious hope. That someday that invisible part of us that's still in the presence of God as a believer is going to be reunited with a new body. And then Thessalonians says it so plainly, will be, will be body, soul, and spirit once again. And so always remember that when you see, and especially in the King James Version, the word sleep, it does not mean that the soul sleeps. It does not mean that it ever loses its consciousness because the soul cannot die. It's an eternal thing that's going to go on into eternity someplace. And that's the whole teaching of the Word of God is that you and I, in the invisible, are going to keep right on living in through all eternity. I'll never forget, I heard somebody, and I don't remember who it was, but we were listening to him preach in, in one of our churches or something, and he said, our salvation will last as long as God does. How long is that? That's forever. God will never cease. And so that's how long our salvation is going to last, as long as God lives. But on the other hand of the coin, there is nothing in Scripture to indicate that the lost person is going to cease to exist any sooner. And so we have to maintain, as awful as it is, that the lost person is going to spend eternity in their lost estate like we will enjoy it in our saved estate. It's a fact of Scripture that that which created, that God created, even though it was invisible, it was created with no end, because he has no end. Okay, didn't intend to do that. You got that free for nothing. All right, so now let's go on. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. What does he mean by that? Well, you can just about imagine what a disappointment it would be to suddenly realize that everything that you've been hanging on to was for nothing. It would just be utter disappointment. And we all appreciate disappointments because we have too many of them in this life. And so here we have the assurance, though, that we won't be disappointed because God is eternal. All right, now then, the but now, we're you know, this series has been interesting. I've enjoyed getting ready for it. And the other day, we had the couple stop by the house who heads up the mission to the Ukraine, where you've been reading and seeing a little more about in our newsletters. And they use our tapes and our books, and they're putting it all in Russian in the Ukraine. Well, anyway, the president of that mission and his wife stopped by the other day, and we no more and sat down to our old kitchen table, and he was telling us some of the things. He said, but God. <laughs> and I said, hallelujah, you've been seeing the last program. Oh, he says, I love him. And that's so true. But God, see? All right, now, once in a while, we digress and use one of the other now, uh, words. Now, this one is, but now. All right, but now, see? On this side of his resurrection, but now Christ is risen from the dead and he's become the first fruits of them that slept or again that died physically. But they didn't die in the realm of the soul and spirit because that goes right on into the Lord's presence. All right, now then over those last several programs, we took from this but now and we started looking at the resurrections of the various groups of people. And we picked that up in uh, verse 23. Verse 23. Here's, here's where we really get the, the meat of all this. Every man in his own order. Now the word man here again is generic. It means men, women, boys, girls. See? All right. So everyone in his 
own order or group. It's a military term, I think, in the Greek, which signified various uh, organizations in the chain of command in the military. Those of you who have been in, you know what I'm talking about. You've got the platoon and the company and the battalion and the regiment and the division and the army, see? Well, every address to a man in service is directed then to his particular military organization. All right, now Paul is using that same, by Holy Spirit inspiration, of course, using that same analogy that in the resurrections, not everybody's going to be resurrected at once. There's going to be various groups, and everyone is going to be in their own designated group. Now, you remember in our last taping, one of these last four or five programs, we showed then that the first ones to be resurrected were the first fruits or the sampling of the harvest field as Israel practiced the harvest. And uh, let's see, we put it on the board. I guess it's been erased since then. But uh, remember, I put it up here as a little square 40-acre patch. And according to Jewish law, when they came in to harvest the field of barley or wheat, first they would come in and pick up those earliest ripening stems of grain. And they'd bring them together into a sheaf, and they'd take it to the temple and wave offer it before the priest and so forth. Well, it was called the offering of the first fruits, the sampling of the major crop. Okay, then, after they had taken the first fruits out and the major part of the crop is now right, then they would go in and they would harvest the whole field, but they had to leave gleanings and they had to leave the corners. That was Jewish law. All right, so we covered all that. So after the first fruits were taken out, and we went back to Matthew 27 and showed how that was the group of uh, Jewish believers, no doubt, that came out of the grave after his resurrection, went into the city, and then from there they were evidently taken up into glory. All right, now then we've been waiting 1,900 and some years for the crop itself to be taken. And we feel that that's the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, and that'll be the major resurrection of the greatest number of believers of all time. And then we went on to show that the gleanings and the corners would be resurrected later. And we didn't get time to cover all that. So now we're going to cover, in this first half hour at least, or maybe in the next one, who comprised the corners, who comprised the gleanings. Now, I guess I should put the orders up here. First, we had the first fruits. The first fruits were those samplings that came out of the grave after Christ. The second is the body of Christ, which is the far the largest number of believers of any time throughout biblical history. Now, today we're going to be looking at these leftovers or the corners and the gleanings. Okay, let's go back first and foremost to pick up the resurrection of those who are not in the body of Christ. Go back with me to Daniel, chapter 12. Now I know there are those who teach only one general resurrection. Everybody is going to be resurrected at the same time. Well, I beg to differ. And... Uh, I'm used to that. I'm used to sort of being out there in the small minority. <laughs> I don't claim to be alone. Don't ever think for a minute that I'm the only one that teaches the way I teach. There are many, many, many. But even in the whole, we're still a small percentage. All right, Daniel chapter 12. Now this is the, probably the, what shall I call it, the parallel Old Testament portion of scripture dealing with resurrection, as 1 Corinthians 15 is in the new. So Daniel 12, and we'll just start at verse 1 to keep it simple. Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince who stands for the children of thy people. Now remember, Daniel is a Jew who are the thy people. Well, Israel. 
God's chosen people, Daniel's people. All right? And so Michael, the prince, shall stand up for the children of the people of Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one found written in the book. In other words, every believing Jew is finally going to escape the horrors of the tribulation at the second coming of Christ. Now, I guess I should show you a few of the references that refer to that. And uh, I'm just debating which one to look at first. Should I look at Jeremiah 30? I think that's the one that speaks of it. Yeah, back to Jeremiah 30. Now, again, you've got to realize I do some of these things without planning to, so bear with me. Jeremiah 30. This is what Daniel is being led to write about. This last seven years of human history, the last half of which will be beyond our comprehension. And now Jeremiah describes it. Jeremiah chapter 30. Start at verse 6, honey. Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 6. I'll wait till you all find it, because we want you to see this with your own eyes. Jeremiah 30, verse 6. Ask you now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned to paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob here is referring to the nation of Israel. But he shall be saved out of it. Now again, we have to be careful, knowing Scripture with Scripture, that Paul makes so plain the whole nation won't experience this being saved, but only a small remnant. All right, now let's jump all the way up to Matthew 24, where Jesus is speaking of the very same identical time that Daniel is, and Jeremiah. Matthew 24. Now, of course, the first 14 verses all deal with the first half of these last seven years, which are going to be bad enough, but they're nothing compared to the last half. All right, now Jesus picks it up in his own words. If you've got a red-letter edition, it's in red, starting in verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, that is, in the temple. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then, in other words, when they see the Antichrist come into the temple, to the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, probably, and that's speculation, because we're going back to a Greek uh, premier or general or whatever he was, when he went into the temple in uh, the time that Greece was ruling Jerusalem, which would be about 300 B.C., and he hated the Jew, and just to cause consternation among the nation of Israel, he offered a hog on the temple altar, and it infuriated the Jews, of course, and so consequently it was called an abomination. Well, no doubt the Antichrist is going to do much the same thing. All right, and so Jesus is putting his stamp of approval on Daniel's prophecy. So when you see that abomination of desolation, desecrating the temple there in Jerusalem, because the temple will be rebuilt, remember. All right, when you see that happen, verse 16, then... Let them who are in Judea, the area of Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let them who are in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child and to those that are nursing in those days. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, 
neither on the Sabbath day, which, of course, according to Jewish law, would limit their walk to a half mile or so. That wouldn't even get them out of Jerusalem today. So he says, pray that it won't be on a Sabbath day. Now, verse 21, for then this midpoint of the tribulation, this time of Jacob's trouble, for then, Jesus says, shall be great tribulation. The first half is going to be bad, but the last half is going to be great, beloved. It's going to be beyond human comprehension, see? For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. All you have to do is just use a little common sense reflecting on human history. Look at the horrible, horrible days that the human race has experienced in the last 6,000 years. There have been all kinds of horrible times. Hitler's Holocaust was probably the worst, of course. But what's coming is even going to be worse than the Holocaust. And see, people can't get a, a, a handle on that. It is going to be beyond human comprehension because when you get to the end of that seven years, there's only going to be just a sampling of human beings left alive. It's going to take almost the whole human race in its way. All right, so those are all uh, pictures concerning these final days. Now come back with me to Daniel who uses almost the same language in verse 1. That's what made me think about these other two portions. That there's going to be a time such as never was since there was a nation. Now that's back in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. We just read a little bit ago. Daniel 12, verse 1. For there shall be a time of trouble, Jacob's trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. See now, even back here in Daniel's day, way back at about 550 B.C., the Holy Spirit directs Daniel to use the same time frame that Jesus did. That right up until the end of time as we know it, there is not going to be a portion of time so horrendous as this last three and a half years. You see that? All right, now move on. At that time, thy people shall be delivered. Well, it'll be the second coming of Christ. See? All right, let's look at another one a minute. Go ahead from Daniel. Go towards the front. Go to Jeremiah, uh, Zechariah, chapter 14. And we got the same kind of a picture. Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, we'll just start at verse 1. Now, this is prophecy. And this all fits with what Jesus said in Matthew 24. It fits with what John writes in the Revelation. And so we know it's true. This isn't just some idea that some men have dreamed up. This is the Word of God. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord Cometh. And that's the, uh, the term for those final seven years leading up to his second coming. That day of the Lord cometh and thy spoil. In other words, everything that has been left for the victorious enemy shall be divided in the midst of thee. In other words, the Gentile armies are just going to come in and help themselves to everything that belonged to the Jewish people. Verse 2. But this is all part of God's design. So he says, I. See? This is God's design. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the houses shall be taken, or the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled. In other words, they'll just be devastated, looting like you have never seen. And the women ravished. That's just another term for rape. There's going to be more rape taking place in Jerusalem again over a period of time like the world has never seen. Half the city shall go forth into captivity. They're going to be overrun by these Gentile armies. And the rest will not be able to be cut off from the city. They're going to be trapped. But now verse 3. Here is the promise. At the last 
moment possible. Then shall the Lord go forth. That's Christ now at his second coming. He's going to leave heaven and he's going to come to the planet with all of his power, I think the angelic host, and he will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And now verse 4. We know this is a literal, physical, visible second coming. What does the next verse say? And his feet shall stand in that day. Now what does that indicate? Physical, visible. And his feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And you who have been to Jerusalem, no doubt, like we do, the first thing we do, we go from the airport right up to the Mount of Olives, give everybody a view of the whole city. Well, it won't have changed one bit by the time Christ returns. It's still going to be there. And that's why it lists it in that way. Then uh, the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, the Mount of Olives shall cleave, and so on and so forth. And then I always like to jump over to verse 9. This will introduce then the final thousand years of the planet's history when Christ will set up his kingdom and he's going to set up his throne room in Jerusalem and it's as plain as English can make it. Verse 9, And the Lord, that's God the Son, that's Jesus the Christ, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth, not just Israel, but he will rule and reign as king of kings and lord of lords over the whole planet. And in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. See, and it's so obvious that this is the kingdom finally coming into fruition that he talked about all the way up through the Old Testament, a constant prophetic reference to this glorious kingdom over which Christ is going to rule and reign. And it's going to be heaven on earth. Satan is gone. The curse is lifted. Sin is gone. Death is gone. And it's going to be a literal heaven on earth. And that's what we have to understand. All right, but at the same time, that time as we know it is now going to be interrupted and Christ sets up his kingdom, we have to have the resurrection of all the believers from day one until that time. Well, now we still haven't gotten far enough to get there, but we'll pick it up in the next half hour where the rest of these believers will be resurrected. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.